All right, what's up guys? I hope you're doing well. James here from jamesdforsight.com. As you can tell, another change of scenery in a different hotel room, traveling for work again. It's kind of a trend at the moment, um, doing a lot of that. But either way, kind of getting into the United Reserve Bank plan, right? So what exactly was it? Um, and we're going to go over its 11 kind of core powers in a way. Um, so the United Reserve Bank plan was kind of the it's not even it wasn't really even like a drafted bill it was kind of like a discussion or a kind of proposed um idea right so it was offered in descriptive form to quote warburg specifically and basically what this was was it was kind of paul warburg's idea of kind of or i guess initial idea of the kind of ideal central banking system as applied to the united states right something along those lines right and he starts to talk about like the basically regionalization of the country for the banking system like he talks about originally wanting to divide it into 20 zones um, where each one has kind of a local banking association that sort of thing um, dividing or diversifying the interests of the members of the board of directors so whether that be like the individual banks or as a whole when you have that kind of governory board uh, board over the entire system what we now see as the board of governors um, wasn't originally like that right and so that was kind of his idea he had that basically the board of directors was going to have representatives of different parts of the economy itself it had bankers and it also have some kind of political entities as well and what i mean by that specifically so let's see he has kind of just more or less quoting him it may be thoroughly representative of the various interests and districts of the country that it may be non-political non-partisan and non-sectional a certain number of the directors say three-fifths should be appointed by the banking associations a further number perhaps one-fifth should be elected by the stockholders so basically the banking associations part the bankers three-fifths so sixty percent and then one-fifth one-fifth of that should be um of the total should be the stockholders according to this basically the business side of things um, that's where you get like the whole more domain knowledge depending on the region of the country you're in right and then the other ones would be um, kind of like ex office um, political entities, kind of. At least that's how I lump them in. So you have like the Secretary of Treasury, the Comptroller the of the Currency, and the Treasurer, right? And those are the, kind of the three that you see pop up a lot in this type of discussion. So really talking about diversifying the commercial interests um, and making sure that those are representative throughout the country, right? And so getting onto the main powers of the kind of his proposed plan, right? So the first one out of the 11 is essentially like no, I, no IOER, interest on excess reserves, right? And this is something that's stated explicitly in a lot of the later pieces that he wrote, but just to, con to remain contiguous with this. So to accept deposits from the from the government of the United States and from members of the banking associations only. So basically kind of defining what the depository institutions should be at this time according to his plan. So no interest should be paid on such deposits. These deposits are the bank reserves that he's talking about. Um, but they might be counted as cash and as part of the required reserve. And then basically by banks and trust companies and, that's, and so on, right? That's the first one. Second one is to buy from members of the banking associations at a, at a discount rate to be published from time to time, commercial paper having not more than 28 days to run and at least issued and issued at least 30 days before the date of rediscounting, right? So basically buying commercial paper with less than 28 days, um, a very, very short term commercial paper, really trying to kind of push that commercial paper market um, into the system kind of how he was defining this should be the most kind of liquid and fundamental asset of the um, Of the monetary system in general from his point of view And so that's really what he's trying to push because this wasn't really developed at this time in the United States um, it had there was a developed version in the um, in Europe at the time and that's kind of what he was trying to model it after in a way and then basically the third one 
is basically the same thing. And there's, I think, three of these total. Yeah, three of these total um, of the three powers are basically different durations of commercial paper. But it's just as you go out in duration, basically the amount of endorsement has to change. So like for the third one that he gave, it's basically buying commercial paper between 28 days and 90 days to run, um, basically until it matures. But with the endorsement of at least one, it seems, only with the endorsement or guarantee of the banking associations to which the member belongs, right? So with respect to that banking association, which what, with whatever reason or region it would be, in our case now, kind of obviously not a complete comparison, but what we would kind of refer to that as now, what to kind of make have it make sense in our current system is one of the regional Federal Reserve Banks, say like the Kansas City Fed or whatever, right? So the fourth one is to buy at a discount rate to be published from time to time. Paper having not more than 90 days to run, drawn by a commercial firm and accepted by a bank, trust company, or banker and endorsed by a bank, trust company, or banker, right? Basically just continuing and he gives other examples of different forms of endorsement, right? So to continue away from the commercial paper part, as you can tell, three of the 11 are specifically for that. So to buy bills on England, France, and Germany, and such other comp countries as may be decided upon, such bills to have a maximum maturity of 90 days, to bear one commercial signature to be drawn out and accepted by a well-known foreign banking house and endorsed by a member of a banking association or a banker in good standing. Right, it's basically trying to also take in that foreign side of things, specifically calling out England, France, and Germany because at the time they were the major uh, players and kind of the global marketplace in a way, um, but also allowing the opportunity for other countries to kind of take their place or just the addition of new countries, right? And so six, to deal in bullion and to contract for advances on, of bullion giving security thereof and paying interest on such advances, basically being able to buy, trade gold, right? He's talking about gold, especially in the kind of, again, international trade kind of framework. Um, seven, to buy and sell bonds uh, and treasury notes of the United States also. That was one of the major arguments of like kind of where this, uh, how the system, sh what should be the kind of fundamental assets? Should it be gold, should it be debt? treasury bonds, should it be commercial paper, right? So kind of what should it be and whose kind of liability should it be? Um, that was major argument in the construction of both the United Reserve Bank plan and later the, um, the bills that became, that basically matured into the Federal Reserve Act, right? And that's something you see a lot um, throughout the discussion. So eight, to issue circulating notes payable on demand in gold, such and such notes to be secured by bills, right? And gives um, 33.33 whatever, uh, 33 and a third percent of the aggregate amount of notes outstanding basically had to be backed by gold, right? According to his plan. So nine, to establish branches and places where there are head offices of banking associations. So you have to keep in mind kind of the, um, where the banking system was at the time when this was kind of drafted to begin with, um, with the National Banking Act of 1863, I believe is the date off the top of my head. Uh, but basically you had three different kind of categories of banks where you had the Central Reserve cities, um, which essentially are kind of analogous to our, the cities in which we have a Federal Reserve Bank now, so like New York City, um, Kansas City, St. Louis. Those aren't exact examples that kind of moved around in the whole kind of construction of the system itself, um, but just to give analogous examples. And then you had uh, reserve cities, which were basically larger cities, like I'd say Minneapolis at the time, but they weren't like a major um, trading hub, we'll say, during this time period. And you have to keep in mind, this is like the very first decade into kind of the second decade of the 1900s, right? And so that's the time slot of history we're kind of looking at. And then you had the um, the country banks, which are just kind of everything else that kind of goes out and the, what we would deem as like the member banks, right? Um, or depository, depository institutions that we have now, right? Those are kind of the three sections that we'd have, 
right? And it's really kind of transferring from that system into kind of what was maturing into the Federal Reserve System later, right? So 10, uh, to request banks or trust companies desirous of making use of the services, the services of the United Reserve Bank to keep with its branches a cash balance commensurate with the amount of business done by them. So basically kind of holding reserves in a way at their specific United Reserve Bank. And again, proportional kind of the how much business they do with them, right? And that's kind of how they, the initial proposal was according to his plan. And finally, to join the Clearinghouse Association of the various cities where the bank and its branches are located. So they did have Clearinghouse Associations. It's kind of like the, I'm gonna go out on a limb here because I don't remember specifically or exactly, but I believe it was the panic in 1907 to where basically with the whole panic in New York, the clearing houses basically issued clearing house certificates to kind of fulfill liquidity needs. Um, so it's kind of, they created their own kind of currency in a way to help with settlement and just kind of make it function before things settled down, right? And so this kind of, clearing houses were a major thing and that was really kind of the pushing point for central reserve in general is to have this kind of central clearing house for settlement throughout the entire country right to really help with kind of intra national trade right or domestic trade okay and then basically that was kind of the whole the branch system in general and then you had the central office which he said was merely just to indicate policy um, and the power to fix the discount rates was vested in the central office. Kind of what we would say is like the FOMC slash Board of Governors, kind of a mixture of the two, or at least in function, right? And so it was specifically stated that these discount rates need not be, need not necessarily be the same in all branches. And we kind of saw this also in the beginning of the Federal Reserve System with the Federal Reserve Act, where basically the different reserve banks could have different discount rates, right? They didn't have to all have the same rate. Fed funds wasn't a thing originally, right? It wasn't like everyone had to have five and a half percent or whatever it was at the time, right? It basically like each one could have slightly different, at least that's what I noticed from some of the data that showed up is they would be different, but it wouldn't be like drastically different, at least kind of in total or in general, right? Throughout that time period, it was kind of more or less dependent on what was necessary. Again, I guess kind of in closing, where I'm basically getting this from, uh, this is a work of the public domain, just so you guys know. I did look that up because it's, I don't know why I think that stuff is interesting. But the Federal Reserve System, its origin and growth, it's the Paul Warburg kind of scholar's choice thing. It's a bit of a boat anchor, uh, 800 pages or so. It's one of those, finished it, reading it a few months ago and just kind of been slowly going back and studying and kind of really trying to synthesize the information and break it down kind of step by step and just go through it, right? And so with that being said, I'm gonna leave this here. I'm going to, the plan is basically to do more of this as well because Paul Warburg's just one side of things. Obviously he's kind of known as like the father of the Federal Reserve sort of thing, at least in kind of, I guess you'd say like the mainstream argument um, with respect to the creation of the Federal Reserve. And as you can tell by some of the other videos I've done with like uh, Murray Rothbard's work, I have one by um, Crozier, um, which is completely different point of view. I haven't read it yet, but it's definitely on the list. Oops. And, um, but yes, anyways, just kind of giving a slight intro into what's to come. Right, so anyways, I'm gonna leave this one here. So I hope you guys have a good night and I will see you on the next one.